Let me see if we're connected. It's eerily quiet. Okay, we're live. <laughs> we are live. Okay, everybody, happy Sunday, happy Pride Month. My name is Julie Briskman, Supervisor for Algonquin District in Loudoun County. And today we are taking some time to celebrate Pride Month. And I really appreciate you joining my Pride Month Town Hall. And I have some awesome people here to share information um, about the community and what's going on and everything that's changing and happening. And I can't wait to get to um, get to ask them a bunch of questions. <laughs> um, I want to thank, uh, in particular, Teresa Keeter -Dick Dickerson for, um, from Equality Loudon for helping us organize and pull the town hall together. Um, it was really important for me to hold this event um, during the month of June uh, to celebrate and honor the LGBTQ plus community. Um, Pride Month is celebrated every year in the month of June to honor the 1961 Stonewall Uprising in Manhattan which was a tipping point for the gay liberation movement in the United States. And today is actually the anniversary of that tipping point. So even though Pride Month is coming to a close, I think it's very um, serendipitous that we're holding our town hall today and important. Memorials are held uh, during this month for those members of the community who have been lost to hate crimes or HIV AIDS. And the purpose of the commemorative month is to recognize the impact that the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals have had on our history locally, nationally, and internationally. Uh, Pride Month is also an opportunity uh, for more peaceful protests and to raise political awareness of current issues facing this community. Um, so raising awareness is why uh, we are here today. And I know that I really still have a lot to learn uh, to affect change at the local level um, for our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. And an hour is not nearly enough time to tackle all the issues, but we're going to try to get to some. Uh, we hope we can touch on the uh, Virginia Values Act which will extend um, existing state non-discrimination protections in public employment, housing, credit, and credit to Virginians um, on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, and several other characteristics beginning July 1. Uh, the recent Supreme Court decision, Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia, uh, the court ruled that an employer uh, violates uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 when uh, it intentionally fires an individual employee based in part on sex. And uh, the legal cu and cultural battles facing our LGBT community and today and some next steps. I'm pleased to be joined by Charlotte Clymer, a nationally recognized writer and LGBTQ advocate and former spokesperson for the Human Rights um, Commission. Evelyn Brumar, a social activist in Prince William County, Virginia and founder of Casa Brumar Foundation, an organization that helps uh, provide safe spaces and community support and educational resources. Jordan Costin, an advocate and a founder of Safe Space Nova, an organization dedicated to providing safe, accepting, supportive environment to LGBTQ youth. Um, Equality Loudon, Teresa Keeter Dickerson, a community activist and secretary of the board for Equality Loudon. Dr. Jerome Hunt, assistant professor of political science at Long Beach City, whose research focuses on black leadership in a post-racial America and socioeconomic social justice issues affecting the Black community and Black LGBTQ community. Christopher Candace Tuck, a gender fluid parent in Loudoun and activist um, in Leesburg and president of Equality Loudoun, Melissa Cooper. So those are our very esteemed guests. I thank you all so much for coming. This town hall will be recorded and available on my Facebook page, facebook.me forward slash Supervisor Briskman. And you can submit questions there or to Zachary.Harris at Loudon.gov. So let's get started. Charlotte Clymer, um, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, today is the anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. Mm -hmm. um, the uprising began with a series of spontaneous and somewhat violent demonstrations by members of the LGBTQ community in response to police, a police raid at the Stonewall Inn. Um, we are experiencing several uprisings and rebellions currently in the United States in protests of police violence against the black population. And I wanted you especially to address the intersection of those communities and um, how they may or, or may not be working together in an inclusive way. And please feel free to expand on, on anything else. Sure. Well, you got the uh, date exactly right. 51 years ago, uh, LGBTQ people 
um, uh, well, specifically, trans women of color led the way in doing this, uh, launched, uh, you know, protests against police violence and brutality at the Stonewall Inn um, in New York. Uh, I mean, launching the modern gay rights movement or launching the modern LGBTQ rights movement. Um, and it becomes at a particular poignant time in our, you know, modern day, uh, being with the protest of Black Lives Matter over the past month, of course, this is Pride Month. Um, and it, it marks a particularly important intersection between the queer community and communities of color. Um, you know, throughout our history, queer people of color and specifically trans people of color had led, have, have led the way in fighting for LGBTQ rights. Um, but it hasn't always and, and still often isn't um, easy um, or certainly welcoming for queer people of color. Uh, who have been routinely marginalized, you know, pushed out of uh, queer leadership spaces, uh, and yet have still fought on uh, for rights for the entire community, not just uh, not just a certain subsection of it. Um, and so, you know, our responsibility right now is to ensure that we're fighting for the most vulnerable people in the LGBTQ community. Ironically, trans people of color, despite their constant leadership within uh, the queer rights movement. Um, for example, um, the most one of the most vulnerable groups um, in the country are trans black women uh, who uh, have formed the majority of murders against trans people uh, for the last several years. In 2018, there were 26 trans people killed. Last year, there were another 26. This year, at least 15 trans people have been killed. The vast majority of all of them were black trans women uh, who are put into dangerous situations because of the lack of affordable housing, uh, the lack of uh, access to equal employment, uh, to credit, to jury service. Uh, so the fact that we are, you know, at this moment of equality, but we still have a long way to go uh, is especially, especially critical in terms of how we are fighting for, you know, trans people of color and specifically trans women of color who have so often been on the forefront of this movement. Yeah, I think that the, um, the women's movement has had some of those issues as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we went through the first wave of the women's movement, the second wave of fem feminist movement. And I see kind of the same thing happening um, in some of the other larger movements in, in the work that you do. Um, how are you working to kind of resolve these sorts of issues and make sure that things are inclusive? Well, you know, first of all, it comes with giving up space. Uh, you, you know, you, you have to make sure that uh, especially queer organizations and queer projects uh, are centered um, in the obstacle space by uh, trans people of color in general and specifically black trans people. Um, you know, we, we are nowhere near where we need to be, uh, but we're certainly making a lot of progress. Uh, HRC, for example, uh, is now led by a uh, black gay man, Alfonso David. Uh, for the first time in our organization's history, we're, it's led by a person of color, which is incredible um, to say nothing of a black man uh, who immigrated to the United States at an early age. Awesome. Um, so there are several intersections there that are great, but you know, I, I, I really strongly believe that until this movement is uh, firmly centered in the leadership of you know, trans people of color, and specifically we have black trans women at the forefront who are supported by the entire community, we're not where we need to be. Yeah, I, I hear you on that. Um, one more question, uh, Charlotte, and um, this kind of goes to your work with, with HRC and um, probably what you're doing now, but um, do you have any thoughts and observations um, either on the Virginia Values Act or any national initiatives that you're sort of watching um, that we should be aware of? Sure, and we'll get into, uh, I'm sure we'll get into Title VII a little later. That was the big Supreme Court case from like a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, um, which is a huge day, uh, an enormous victory for LGBTQ people. Um, you know, part of the struggle right now is that once same-sex marriage was uh, legalized by the Supreme Court in 2015, huge victory, but it kind of gave, I think, most Americans the impression that the LGBTQ rights movement is over because the marriage equality is in the law books, that must mean all discrimination is banned, right? <laughs> right. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> That's not true. Um, and so, in you know, most of the United States right now, um, even though that the Supreme Court just said that discrimination in employment is now unlawful uh, against LGBTQ people, 
most aspects of the public square, po public accommodations, housing, credit, all these other areas, it's still legal to discriminate against LGBTQ people in most of the country. And so what the Virginia Values Act did, it was passed in April, um, and it made Virginia the first state in the South to uh, have non-discrimination protections for LGBTQ people, the first state in a decade to add both sexual orientation and gender identity to existing non-discrimination law, and it was the first state since 1993 to add a prohibition on discrimination in public accommodations protecting all Virginians where none existed before. Um, and so that's great. It goes into effect on July 1st, so Tuesday. Uh, it is an enormous, enormous thing. Uh, it means that, you know, finally Virginia is the kind of state where LGBTQ people can navigate public life knowing that the law has their backs. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we, we have that legal battle, but we also have the cultural battle, and we have to make sure that we're fighting that as well. Yeah, I hear I hear you on that. Yes, Virginia made a lot of progress this year, yes. <laughs> for sure. I'm very happy with my state. Um, thank you, Charlotte. Um, ch chime in at, at, at any time. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hunt a question now. Um, Dr. Hunt, in your research, um, you focus on Black leadership and post-racial America. Um, what does that leadership look like today, and, and how is it different from the leadership in the civil rights era? Well, thank you first and foremost for having me on this event here. Um, I think that it's different in terms of the fact that we're seeing a more younger uh, leadership taking place, um, a leadership that's not willing to take a step back, but really being a little bit more forceful and understanding the fact that uh, we live in a society where many people don't believe that systematic racism actually exists. Um, we have toted the lines for so long about we don't see color that it kind of has um, in many ways discouraged the progress that we've moved forward. Because when we talk about that we don't see color, we're basically ignoring the diversity that exists within our country. Um, and I think that the, the new generation that is taking up the mantle, particularly in the Black Lives Matter movement, is really showing that race does matter, particularly Black trans uh, lives do matter, that we when we have these conversations that we are really trying to think of the African American community and other communities of colors in silos, that everybody thinks and feels the exact same way, but there is a lot of diversity that exists within the community. And I think that these leaders are really pointing out to that and really making sure that people are paying attention to that, that we're moving past the fact of that when we talk about equality, we also need to talk about equity. It's not enough to just have equality. You need to have equity with those things. It's not just enough to have marriage, but not um, have health coverage, not to be looked at the same way in terms of housing, adoptions, all sorts of things in everyday walk of life. Interesting. Um and can you tell us a little bit about your research um, and research in post-racial America? Do you have a prediction? <laughs> I would say before things happen, I kind of had a prediction, uh, but right now I'm not uh, sure exactly what route it is going to uh, really take. I think that it is good that we are seeing this momentum. I hope that this momentum will continue. Uh, particularly, we know that African Americans, for instance, are really the key towards individuals uh, capturing the presidency um, in particular. And we mm. really need leaders to speak to the African American community and this growing um, diverse community that we're seeing. Because I think that the census data just came out, or the preliminary census data just came out, I think a couple of days ago, that showed that for the first time, we're seeing a, a wide growth of non white individuals in this country. And our leaders really need to realize that this is the future. These are the people mm. that we are needing to speak for now and in the future. Future, and that it's just not a simple placation of their particular vote to just get them to get office for four years or for eight years, that we really have to uh, mm -hmm. put some substantive types of policies and material forward. And I'm hoping that we can use this uh, propelling motion of things that are happening in the country with COVID, with Black Lives Matter, to really say that, hey, the, the communities of color um, are here and they are not going anywhere. And it's about time that we finally address the issues that are impacting. Them. Yeah, and I would think not only letting the community speak, giving a platform, but hearing and digesting and then doing something about it, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a locally elected official, I'm definitely seeking ways to, to be able to not only listen and hear like we are today, but then how does that translate into, you know, real change at, at the local level? 
I appreciate well, that. Um, well, I think if I could add into that, what I think please. that can happen with that is that it needs to be a continuous dialogue being open between locally elected officials and the actual community. And it really needs to be constant check in. It just can't be that, oh, well, we did this and then we don't come back until it's election time. Very good point. I wish I had the funds to just like hire you all on my staff <laughs> and get your feedback like on a daily basis. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm, I'll move on to Evelyn. Um, so good to see you, Evelyn. Casa Brumar Foundation. Um, can you tell us, I know this is new for you. Can you tell us a little bit, well, maybe about a year now, tell us a little bit about um, what you do and how you're serving the community in Prince William. Thank, thank you for having me. Um, yes, it is new. It, and it happened because um, I was personally, uh, my family was personally attacked by my supervisor. So I had no, my representative for this district, and I had no recourse. I've tried to file a complaint. Nobody would take it on. Uh, there wasn't a, commu a larger community that can help advocate with me. So I had to do a grassroots networking and bring them together so that we could start advocating for LGBTQ rights here in Princeton County. And um, from that, we made some changes and we made some proclamations and we made some awareness in our school districts and our representatives and also in, and um, the people who uh, who represent us in our as delegates and senators. So that from that, I noticed that we can't lose this momentum. There has to be a permanent organization, not only here advocating for the LGBTQ community, but also bringing in members from the LGBTQ community that have been disenfranchised and don't want to participate or don't are too afraid to speak up because they're afraid of the repercussions because we had no protections, no federal protections, no statewide protections. And so what I do now with the with Casa Brumar Foundation is we educate, we advocate, and we also help those the most marginalized members of our community. So what we do right now because of COVID, we have done a grant actually negatively impacted by COVID and we we give them grants on, you know they just have to fill out an application and we have a little bit of back and forth and usually they're approved and we try to help them the best we can and connect them to services. That's fantastic. And you mentioned that you got started um, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo I hope we're okay. Um, you got started because of something that happened locally and but you were you were able to move a needle down there in Prince William County. Can you just briefly describe what, what happened and, and what, what change you were able to, to affect? Yes, so what happened was we were working, my, I was working with local, um, local politics because I wanted to make sure that representation that we had was inclusive. And so I was actually in, in charge of 12 polling precincts in my district. And at one of them, my daughter was helping out, my adopted daughter was helping out, passing out uh, sample ballots. And my supervisor, um, in a conversation with her, told her, when she told her, my supervisor that uh, she had two moms, my supervisor told my daughter, every child deserves a mother and father in a biblical sense. And, you know, it was hurtful because this this child came, grew up through the foster care system and was a teenager when we, we adopted her. And so for the first time in her life, she had a loving family. And for somebody who was elected to represent us, to dismiss members of her community that she should be representing and to hurt a child like that, just built a fire underneath me that I'm like, I am not stopping. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we did. I, I kept going to school board meetings. I kept going to board of county supervisors meeting. I kept talking to the supervisors and other supervisors. I've got I got Pride Month proclaimed for the first time ever in Princeton County a few years ago. <laughs> and this year we got Pride Month proclaimed for the first time within our school district in our whole county. So I'm awesome. I am not stopping until it is totally inclusive until we can learn about LGBTQ people in our school just in our schools and we can have representation in our on our local elected board, um, board. So I'm not stopping. Now, now is that person still on the board? Yes. Oh boy. Okay, we can talk about that later. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually Loudoun County as well for the first time we had a Pride Month proclamation um, in uh, at the board level. I know the schools did it this year too. Uh, Christopher might be able to let us know. I, I can't remember if the schools did it last year or not. Um, no, this was the the first year actually, and and yeah, it was really great to work with Equality of Loudoun. We worked with the Loudoun County Democrats to get that to both the Board of Supervisors um, and the school board and help raise awareness. There was even a um, uh, parade, a car parade that we did in early June to help uh, support passing that. So it was a really wonderful experience to see that. 
both come out um, and really uh, largely supported by both boards. That's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm, I was really happy to be a part of that. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Jordan now. Uh, Jordan, uh, Safe Space Nova sounds like a wonderful resource for young people. Um, can you shed some light on um, the current cultural battles facing the young LGBTQ plus community today? And actually, tell us where you're doing most of your work too. Yeah, so um, I guess just a little bit of background on Safe Space Nova. We've been around for about four years. Mm -hmm. We provide positive programming for LGBTQ youth across Northern Virginia. So that's City of Alexandria, Arlington County, Fairfax County, Prince William County, Loudoun County as well. Oh, okay. And the programs that we actually have set up right now are we do social activities for you. So things like uh, uh, miniature monster golf or laser tags, whatever, whatever the youth are identifying as something we want to do. We run out the space, buy food, go hang out, relax. We provide um, some um, adult guidance in terms of just having some safety uh, perimeters around for the youth as they come to our events. So we have that, and then within the past month and a half, we've launched uh, another program, which actually we call Y'alls. It's the Youth Advocacy and Leadership Learning Through Social Support. And we provide a space for young people to come together and develop leadership and advocacy skills, um, create educational programming targeting at peers and adults. So um, more programming is on the way. Every single year we try to introduce new programming. Um, the next one actually on the list for 2021 is actually gonna be mentoring. So as we are as an organization in terms of cultural issues i think one of the biggest issues as it comes to dealing with our youth is just about visibility so knowing that regardless of what your cultural background is that you're actually still you, you exist you actually have a place in our community and that's one of the reasons i created safe space Nova is because as a youth growing up in the south myself as an lgbtq youth um i found that there was just no representation for me there was nobody around i, I grew up in a place that actually i'm um, originally from atlanta georgia there was no gsa's at my school, there were no programming for if you are questioning, if you're having about your um, sexual orientation or your gender identity, there's a place you can actually go and feel like you're you're welcomed in and you're not um, some strange person, some monster where it's just like, this is something that just doesn't happen in the world. So that's why I created Safe Space Nova and we create this welcoming space for the LGBTQ youth. So they know that what they're going through, they're not alone. There are other students who are in the same age group going through this, experiencing the same things. And on top of that, you're also surrounded by allies as well as adults who say, I've been exactly where you are. I've had those same feelings and you're gonna make it through on the other side. So that's very, very important for us. Um, I think culturally, and I think Charlotte may have touched on this um, prior to uh, me speaking, is that we see this intersection about, uh, we see that there's color uh, and cultural background as well as LGBTQ and those two issues is coming together. So I think right now we have the greatest momentum right now as part, me being a, a black as well as being part of the LGBT community is saying like, you know what, we see what marginalization actually is. So let's actually see that in, in both of our communities try to propel us forward. We don't see a lot of that. So mm -hmm. and on the local level, at the state level, as well as the federal level, it's like, let's come together this community and make sure that we're actually continuing to move the needle and let us know, let society know as a whole that we're here. We're not willing to take marginalization anymore, whether we actually are people of color or we're part of the LGBT community. That's awesome. Um, you mentioned that you're working on some leadership um, uh, classes and training and those sorts of things in your groups. Um, how is Loudoun County doing as far as uh, GSAs and that sort of thing? And would your leadership training kind of help a student start one of those organizations? and and then my follow up question would be if if there was somebody in Loudoun County, you know, uh, that, that was interested in starting one of those at their school, um, how would they get in touch with you? OK, uh, let me start first with just kind of uh, the state of affairs of Loudoun County. So when I started uh, Safe Space Nova again four years ago, there was actually a group of middle schoolers who actually came to me from Loudoun County saying that their school wanted to actually they wanted to actually um, celebrate uh, a set aside a day to celebrate Pride Month, just in a day where they wear rainbow colors. They went to their administrators and they were told no. There was no Gay Straight Alliance GSA at the school. And mm -hmm. they felt that they were shut down. And these two girls were actually allies. They identified as heterosexual girls, but they just wanted to be there for friends. They know we're not actually speaking up. So what we did, myself, as well as some other organizations, we pulled our funds and we actually had a Pride Day for them on a Saturday in a local library in Loudoun County. So that's four years ago. I work again, I work with students across all of the counties and I find that of all the, the localities that we work with, Loudoun always seems to be a little bit of a step behind and being more accepting and allowing mm -hmm. GSAs to exist. 
so we're, we are making progress. I am seeing that based off of what I'm hearing in the streets um, from the students, but there's still a lot more work to be done. There are a lot of times where students are saying, well, first of all, kids are coming out at a younger age. So before it was high school, now we're actually seeing a rise in um, kids actually realizing that they're part of the LGBT community in middle schools. But we're still finding a lot of opposition because we find that administrators, um, people on school boards are feeling that you're too young to actually know that you're part of the LGBT community. And as a result, we are not going to allow a GSA. That's part of the issues that we actually have. We're combating every single day. What we do from a leadership standpoint is we want to give you the skills needed so that you can actually become an advocate on your own for our community. So what that looks like is you work with other um, youth who actually want to also be advocates as well you put together presentations and you go present that to the school boards we're also connecting you with the local you know local delegates and senators and whatnot so you can actually meet with them and express your issues yourself so i want to advocate for you but i also want to teach you to be an advocate for yourself so that's what our um y'all's program our, uh, leadership and advocacy program is actually geared towards in terms of wanting to set up a gsa please reach out to us you can easily google us on safe space nova we're always willing to help any student that actually wants to have that gsa and facilitate conversations that need to happen with the appropriate people in the right places so we can actually push that forward that's awesome thank you thank you for your work in loudon county especially i know that we have we have some work to do and that actually is, is a really nice way to dovetail into um Talking with the quality Loudon, Teresa, Jerome, Christopher, and or Melissa. <laughs> um, I know that we are having something actually coming up this week in Loudon County um, with our school board and uh, and equity. So would one of you mind outlining um, what's going to be happening at the school board and then how folks might support? Teresa, Christopher, any? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to get off of mute. Um, yeah, so <laughs> there's buttons everywhere. Anyway, so thank you again for having us. And um, to, at the school board, what we're planning on doing is we're going to speak to the school board members and as a community and just you get 60 seconds to talk about what things are important to you and how you would like to see the school board move forward. And so um, right now there's signups happening. So um, if you need to just reach out to Quality Loudon on um, Facebook and we can get you directed, connected to the right people. Um, and so what we're just looking for is just, we just need voices. We need voices to say, um, you know, we're, we want equity in our county. We want equity in our schools. We're, we're tired of, and like Jerome, um, Jordan said, we're tired of being the last in the, you know, of the counties and we're tired of being behind. We really want to push, push um, our, our equity forward. So that's pretty much what's happening. But what's spe specifically the board tomorrow night is considering an equity report that has um, recommendations in it. Am I correct on that? Yes, that is correct. Um, I, I can't remember all the specifics. I just remember the big thing that's going around in all the spaces that I manage is getting people to sign up to speak. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all I remember. They're just like speak to show your support for the equity recommendations that, that might get pushed back. And I'm not sure if I want to talk about some of the other stuff, but yeah. Right, right. So a lot of people get confused as a supervisor. I don't have a lot of influence over what the school board and the school administration does. Right. But I do also want to encourage folks to, um, gosh, 60 seconds just doesn't seem long enough to talk yeah. about. Uh, <laughs> right. To talk about, you know, your 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 support for something like that. But right. um, Teresa, maybe you could tell me, uh, tell us a little bit about um, what Equality Loudon uh, does in the community and um, and how it plays a role to help the LGBT community and and how it can be supported. Um, yeah, so Quality Loudon, and I'm going to push this over to Melissa in a second. Uh, Quality Loudon is really trying to ensure that we build programming around some of the advocacy that we want to see, as well as education, because that's one thing that I think a lot of people get confused on is because they don't know what's happening, they, they listen to a soundbite somewhere, and that's what gets spewed out. So we're really big on trying to ensure that there's education. Um, we did have some programming that was scheduled. Obviously, we no longer are doing that. So we're just working on on trying to um, sort of like pivot that to more of a virtual space. And I'll let Melissa finish up with some of the other things that we're doing. She's our president. Oh, okay, great. Sure, hi, thanks. Um, so one of the things, just to go back for a second to what Jordan was talking about with Loudoun County School. So for those of you who don't know, Loudoun County did not include um, 
sexual orientation or gender identity in their non-discrimination policy until February of 2019. And that was done by a push of a lot of local advocates um, from Equality Loudon and parents across the county. And so in the school system, we now have this beautiful language. And so part of what we're looking to kind of focus on in the next upcoming year to two years is turning the language of non-discrimination into practice and making sure that we're not just, that we will include, when we say we include protections for hiring staff or for non-bullying policy for students, that it's really there's actions behind it. And so that's, that's what we've always been told by a lot of the students in Lowndes County, that there's no actions or protections behind the word that even with their anti-bullying policy boys had. So that, the, the school system has really been a big focus of loud of equality loud in the past couple of years because we we are contacted constantly by parents mm -hmm. of young children who have no resources who say my you know my my kids trans they've come out to me and they're eight and I don't know what to do and the school system and, you know their teachers don't know what to do and so we've tried we do a lot of trying to connect people to resources and and that's certainly highlighted the lack of, of resources not just in Lamb County, but in, in a lot of Northern Virginia, especially when you get out of Arlington and Alexandria County. So I know Prince William has a lot of the same issues that we have in that. We're really thankful to have people on our, in our county supervisory board that finally understand that, you know, LGBTQ people exist in Loudoun County and are giving voice to us. And this is the first time we've ever done anything like this with someone yeah. in our local government, which is pretty impressive that it's 20. It's a welcome change. <laughs> and thank you, Julie, for that. We really do appreciate that. Because uh, like she said, I've, I've been here for almost well over a decade. And quite frankly, you never, I don't think people, it was, wasn't even whispered, right, <laughs> around here. So this is great. Like this is, this shows an open, an openness and a willingness to learn and be educated and, and to just see that, you know, all we really want is to just live, um, like, you know, and raise our families and go shopping and pay our bills. Like we're just, there's nothing different or other about us. We're just here, right? That's, so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great point. One of the hardest problems for our community is that not everyone uh, walks around in a rainbow suit. It's hard to tell, it's hard to find that camaraderie. It's hard to, I, I as a transgender person myself, I run into people all the time and I, I'm pretty sure they're transgender, but it's so, um, it's dangerous, especially with a lot of the discrimination that's going on to say, hey, I, are you uh, part of the community? Uh, do, do you have you gotten into resources and, and talk to people have support groups? I can help hook you up with that kind of stuff. And you can't even do that because in a lot of places, that's a dangerous thing to do to somebody. Wow. Uh, it, it's something that education and I think this is something that Melissa was talking about. We really focus a lot of effort on the school board because education is key. I've been to dozens of school board meetings and hearing some of the parents, um, we, you know, one of the big things that uh, was led by one of our other uh, members, Charlotte uh, McConnell, is a big gay book drive. And um, yeah. we've been pushing to get a lot more LGBTQ uh, reading material. And what's disheartening more than anything is to see people taking some very, um, I'm trying to think of the very innocent and very well-natured things like a, a book for a young child and my son is five when i came out to him one of the first things that we did was get him a book called um uh <laughs> see how i'm gonna forget off the top of my head um i am jazz which is this adorable book about a little girl who's transgender and she's coming out and talking to her parents and talking about how she's similar and yet you hear people go to the school board and sexualize this and talk about it as if it's, uh, you know, this communist material is just not the case. So we really want to work with the school board and see, is there a better way to, to bring in LGBTQ education at an early age? You know, we're talking about um, sex and life health classes, and we're talking about these issues, getting these kinds of terms and stuff. I, I just had a, a resource meeting, an inclusivity meeting uh, for our DOI. It's a training uh, for our federal agency. and they were talking about these things in, in rather elementary terms because people have no background or education. So being able to get things like books into the classrooms, getting things onto the curriculum, 
that really support. And it's one of the, you know, you hear a lot of, uh, one of my favorite sayings right now is it's not enough to not be racist. You have to be anti-racist. Yes. We have to, we have to <laughs> make sure that we're putting education about the black community, about the LGBT community into textbooks in a responsible way that is forthcoming with, with our history and who we are. Otherwise people get this really bad misinformation and it tears every other effort apart. It would be nice if you wouldn't have to level set people at the age of 30 or 40. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would be nice if they kind of got the level setting in, you know, eighth grade or something like that. So it didn't have to be some big shock, uh, you know, when they end up having an LGBTQ coworker or roommate in college or, or something right. like that. <laughs> um, Actually, Christopher, why don't I, why don't I stay with you? What do you think, you know, as a parent in Loudoun County and, you know, someone who has kids in school and that sort of thing, what do you think allies can do to, to help? And allies well, in government, but also just allies in the, in the community in general, because, you know, there may be other parents in the school who, you know, are actually, you know, would, would, be fine. I don't want to say be fine with because that's that's you know that's not quite the right thing. I want to say they they no, would support after. putting those sorts of books and like like happily support putting those sorts of books in school. So how do we how how can allies help? It's really about showing up. I, I think it was um, uh, Costa was talking earlier about GSAs, and that's something that when I first joined Equality Law, we were talking about kind of the lack of GSAs um, until this Supreme Court ruling. A lot of teachers are talking about how they're afraid they would go to the school board and say, I'm afraid to come out and put a picture of my wife or my husband on my desk. And maybe you'll know that I'm gay or I'm a lesbian. And then the discrimination will start and it will never end. Um, people have a hard time starting GSAs because for a teacher in the school system, if you can't identify yourself and you start hosting these kind of GSA and, and other sorts of LGBTQ supportive meetings, then you're, you're essentially outing yourself in a place where you can get fired for that. The other thing is really standing up and showing up. Um, it's the same kind of battle we've been having for equity for over a year and a half now and hearing some of the really kind of heinous acts that have gone on within the school system, but also hearing these parents show up and, and villainize minority communities. Um, we've got to have a wave of people that show up and drown those voices out because it is hard on a given Thursday. I, I'm, I'm on an HOA board. It is hard to get up, get dressed, and feel like you want to go sit in a room and listen to bureaucracy for two and a half hours. And some of these school board meetings, just like I'm sure the supervisor meetings, go on forever. Yeah. Uh, but if people don't show up, the people who are motivated against our communities are very motivated to show up. We've got to be even more motivated. We've got to get our allies and our, and, and that's the thing. Um, I, I can't remember where I'd heard it, but they said one of the biggest missed opportunities was not including transgender people um, uh, or LGBT people on the census. This is our community is so underrepresented and people say, well, that might be dangerous, but you know what? We can't even get an accurate estimate of how large the LGBTQ community is in this country because so many people are forced into the shadows. They're forced to hide. They, they live lives at home that are secret. And then when you come out, I mean, I've, I've had a wonderful opportunity to come out this last October and it's not been without division. It's been with a lot of hatred on one side, but also a lot of love on the other. And it's amazing to go through that journey. And when you have friends in the community, I have a lot of neighbors that were really supportive at that time. And if it weren't for their help, and that's really kind of the best thing now I could do, be there, show up, show support, share love. That's really what our, community, our movement is about. It's about sharing love. I keep thinking that, you know, you shouldn't have to be like, like what you're saying to me is you sound so brave, you know, and I, I'm just thinking you shouldn't have to be brave just to be who you are. No, no, you, know you no and, and so many in the LGBT community, it's just this act of unbelievable bravery that I don't even know I would ever have to just to be your damn self. So, but, but thank you for all of your work. I really appreciate that. And, and I definitely hope to be an ally and, and, and encourage other allies. Um, in our Jordan, last couple of minutes, I was just, go ahead. Yeah, this is Jordan. I just wanted to kind of just add on to what kind of Chris said in terms of 
Well, and, and you as well talk about being brave as part of the LGBT community. So one thing that I think kind of helped help my allies actually understand the issues that we have to go through is putting them through this question of, or having them think through, what is it like to actually come out as straight? And then obviously the response back is, well, I never had to come out as straight, so that's the norm. I said, okay, well, I guess you consider me not the norm because I have to come out every single time, whether I'm at work or um, in different um, organizational meetings and different things I'm actually a part of. It's constantly having to do that because you see it as not the norm. And then what I try to do is, and I, I don't know if this, is gonna, how this might actually come out, but what I call it is normalized gay for a lot of people. I've worked in IT for over a decade, and I'm generally one of very few people of color and the only gay person in the entire company because I work for um, medium to small size companies. So what I learned is I just like, you know what? I found comfort in my skin when I was actually in my 20s. And that was actually saying, I know that I'm actually gay. I'm comfortable with that. Everybody else in my family and anywhere else in my sphere is gonna have to know that and either be okay with it to be around with me or just not be around me in general. And now that I'm in that space and, 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 and I uh, have a husband that I've been with for several several years, actually over a decade now, I go into this office and I say, one, I'm going to work as hard as I can because nobody's going to look at me as either a gay man or a man of color and try to take away what I know I should actually have, which is my job. And then second, once I've gotten that, that place, I do like, you know, start to slide those pictures on there. And I say, like, you know, my pictures of my husband and my dog. <laughs> um, and I, I, I teach them as, as simple as it sounds. It's like, you know, the things you're dealing with, like, okay, I'm sorry, I gotta stay home. My husband's sick, or I have to go take him to the hospital and things like that. And oddly enough, as simple as that sounds, doing that actually is what helps a lot of my coworkers finally realize that being part of the LGBTQ community is just as normal as being part of the heterosexual community. There's nothing different about it. We experience the same type of things in relationships and marriage. So that's something I kind of take it upon myself as being a proud member of the LGBT community that I got to work with my head up and I do my job and I do it very, very well. And then I also just let you all know that I'm here. I'm just as equal to you and I experience the same things as you do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, Julie, can I add um, something as well? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so um, <laughs> off of what Jordan just said, thank you for saying that, Jordan. Yes, we always are coming out. Every day we are coming out. But here's another thing for our allies. Don't out us. So if we're in a social setting and I don't have my wife with me, it might be because the setting that I'm in, I'm not too sure that it will be accepting. I present very femme so I can pass. And I'm trying to gauge if will I be in danger if I come out. And then I might know somebody that I go, oh, look, here's Evelyn. She's my lesbian friend. She has a wife. And I'm like, oh, you know, is this person you're introducing me to going to be accepting? And also, if you have a friend who is transgender, don't say, oh, this is my trans friend, pronouns she, her. Let her say that. Don't say that for her. You know, just it's just be an ally. Being an ally means you support us. And when it's safe for us, you allow us to make that move on our own. You know what I mean? We don't need you to be our hero. We need you to be there as a support system. And that's just what I wanted to add on to it. I, I wanted, if I say one I thing, I, I, um, I was quoted, I was interviewed for an article and someone asked like, what, what are some of the questions that people ask, um, that want to ask gay people and they can't? And that's exactly what I pulled up. If you want to be an ally, just be the ally. Don't make it about you. It's not about you. And this goes with the LGBT community as well as your, your, your friends of color. Don't be, when you say like what Evelyn said, oh, this is my gay friend. You're making it about you. Cause now you want people to say, oh, look how accepting you are. Just be, this is my friend, Evelyn. This is my friend, Teresa. Nobody like, nobody cares like my my unless I want to talk about my wife I, maybe I don't feel like talking about her that day you know what I'm saying so this is my friend Teresa that's it because that's who we are we're our we're, we're ourselves our our otherness doesn't need to be on blast for you to show yourself that you oh look how accepting you are so that would be the other thing I would say about being an ally just we we are just who we are yeah that's a that's a great point. If I could throw one last one thought one more, sorry to tack on it. It's been a great string of wonderful thoughts. It's being who we are is only one part. Being gay or lesbian or transgender is only one part. I like to build things. I love to hike. I play the piano. I do art. I'm also transgender. That's not all there is to us. This is certainly something a lot of us have to be activists for because not because we want to, but because there's a need for this right now. There's a great and dire need. But really, at the end of the day, 
we we all do the same things we would have done had we been gay or trans or not. It's it's just one part, and that's really something. Looking at the whole person and understanding this is an entire person with an entire life, and they have value and they have worth. Uh, and, and this doesn't define us. It makes us wonderful and and happy. And when we can accept who we are, we have that opportunity to find real true happiness. But otherwise, it's only one piece of us, and that's something I think folks need to remember. Can I slide in with one small bit of advice? Um, make sure that, you know, if, if you're looking for organizations to support, start local. Uh, support local organizations, local projects that are led by LGBTQ people, specifically LGBTQ people of color. National organizations are great, GLAD, HRC, I worked at HRC. You know, these are these are wonderful organizations that do great work, but the the, the bulk of the labor is done by local advocates. You know, organizations led, you know, by folks like Evelyn and Teresa. I mean, these are the these are the ones that need our support. So if you're budgeting out like 50 bucks a month to some nonprofit like HRC, just divert it to a local org who who really does need the money far, far more and is doing a, a great deal of labor um, in communities that need it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. Actually, that's a nice transition. We're we're winding down a little bit, but I wanted to give um each person, you know, a minute or two just to talk about, you know, any sort of message that you want to put out there or any sort of projects you're working on that you want to share. So why don't we start with you, Charlotte? Oh, I, you know, I'm just trying to get the Senate back in November. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like we, we have to do that. Um, you know, it, we need to get the Equality Act passed because right now, other than the Supreme Court ruling on marriage and employment discrimination, we have no federal non-discrimination protections uh, for LGBTQ people in this country. The regulation that the Trump administration just put in, I think three weeks ago now, that would allow medical providers to deny oh. even life-saving health care to trans people and other LGBTQ folks. I mean, that that would, that st nonsense like that would be prevented if we had federal non-discrimination protections that were universal. That's the Equality Act. It's, it's hugely popular. Uh, it's like 70% of Americans support it. The House passed in a bipartisan vote, and the only reason it's not law right now is because Mitch McConnell refused to bring it to the Senate floor for consideration. So if we want to make sure that LGBTQ people in this country are not left behind, you got to make sure we win them back the White House, and you got to make sure we win back the Senate. And so make sure you're focused on those to get that done. Awesome. Thank you, Charlotte. And if you don't follow Charlotte on Twitter, you absolutely should, because not I'm only not <laughs> <laughs> Ted Twitter's like smoking. I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so funny and you're so smart and you you really say things in a very meaningful way and share important information. So really? <laughs> um let's see. Uh wait a minute, I lost I lost my list. Um Dr. Hunt, would you like to share a few last words or any projects you're working on? Sure. Um, well, once again, thank you for having me. Um, I would you. say first and foremost that individuals outside of the LGBTQ community should realize that pride extends outside of June. That we yes. are 365 days a year, um, kind of like how the McDonald's commercial was like Black 365. It's, it's LGBT, Black, Hispanic, Latino, everything 365. Um, I think that we so so focus so much on just individual moments and months and 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 landmarks that we fail to realize that every day individuals are facing multiple forms of discrimination. Particularly if you are an LGBT individual of color, you're facing multiple forms of discrimination, not just for your sexual orientation or gender identity or expression, but because of your gender, um, because of your race, because of any disability or handicap or anything that you may have, you are experiencing these things. And we really need to realize that that is occurring on a daily basis. Um, and then I would also echo what Charlotte had to say is that to vote is that our vote is, is, is critically important. As, as a political scientist, people are going to hate me for saying this, but don't listen to polls. They mean nothing. Okay, you don't know if your vote matters until it's too late. So you have to go out there and vote. If you want to see a change that you want to see, you can't sit at home. You have to get your call your neighbor, call your mom, call whoever, drag them to the polls with you. That's the only way that progress is going to happen. So we sit back and wait for the Supreme Court to do everything. We're going to be waiting a hell of a long time. Um, so that that's my message <laughs> to everyone. Is to, that's awesome. what we need to do. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Evelyn, Casa Brumar, did you have any um, final thoughts or anything you'd like to share? 
I do. You know, I, I when I started Casa Brumar Foundation, I knew that there was a need for it, but it wasn't until I actually launched that I realized how great the need was. And it, it shocked me. And um, so I just wanted to give some information because we're talking about Northern Virginia and also in Prism County. Uh, the, the program that I have going on right now is a COVID relief program to help um, LGBTQ Q youth who have been displaced or negatively impacted. Um, what I've been seeing is that the majority of the people who are applying are trans individuals, immigrant or undocum undocumented Latinx. So it's the, we have a big Latinx population here in Northern Virginia. A lot of them are undocumented or immigrant. And I feel like their voices are not being heard at a time when they can be really, really, really hurt financially uh, because of, uh, you know, well, let me just say this, Princeton County got rid of the 2780G that works with ICE. So now you're not gonna be uh, papers please held up or because of the color of your skin. So that's good for the, the Latinx community. But it's still though, there's a lot of discrimination. It's plus there's that language barrier. So I just wanted to make sure that I know we're doing this in English and a lot of our information is in English mm. and like advocacy in English, but that there's another large minority community in the, in the Latinx LGBTQ community that is not being advocated for in their language that they can understand what their rights are. So that's just what I wanted to put out as well. That's so important because we started out our conversation about sort of the intersectionality between the LGBT community and the black community, but we didn't talk yet about the, the Latinx community as well and that sort of intersectionality. Speaking of um, local organizations, how could someone support Casa Brumar if they wanted to? Yeah. <laughs> so there's two ways we can do it right now because of the pandemic. So. <laughs> You can donate to us because there's two projects we're working on. We're doing that relief program for individuals, for LGBTQ youth who are financially negatively impacted because of the pandemic. And also we have a project of actually building the first community center emergency shelter in Princeton County specifically for LGBTQ people. So that's what we're working on too. <laughs> nice. And how can they, how could somebody support to this? Should they just look up Casa Brumar or? Yeah. Go to casabrumarfoundation.org and there is an application for people who need help and a donations uh, button for you to donate and, and we can work it out that way too. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Thank you so much for being here, Evelyn. I miss you. I miss you too. We'll have to hike at another time. <laughs> yes. Um, Jordan, uh, Kostin, do you, do you have any other thoughts or um, something you'd like to share about Safe Space Nova? Sure, so I'd be remiss um, if I didn't say that I also am a youth facilitator for PFLAG. And for those who are not familiar with PFLAG, I, not, I have to look this up because I always forget what the acronym actually stands for, but people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, um, the parents of those youth. So they actually come together and they actually act as a support group and they actually have different chapters. So there's actually one in Alexandria. I don't know about, I believe there's actually one in Loudoun County, but Prince William and so forth. I do the one actually in Alexandria. And the age group that we actually dealing with is eight to thirteen, eight to thirteen. So what I'm learning is between my work with PFLAG like eight to thirteen, and then what we do at Take Space Nova, our target audience is 14, 18 years old. Is that youth are actually coming out a lot younger. So the more they come out, the more support they have is the best thing, not just for them, but it's for their parents as well. I'm truly encouraged by the work that we do at Safe Space Nova because with every single event we've had, we generally have new faces. What I'm finding is there's still, unfortunately, a lot of people who are not accepting and a lot of those people are parents. So what we try to do is be encouraging for the youth, again, and letting them know that we're here, we're not going anywhere. If they, they need resources, they need assistance, they can actually absolutely call us. And that's what keeps our doors open. We are a very small organization at Safe Space Nova. None of us take home a paycheck. Um, it's about a staff of about eight folks and seven people on the board. So again, I'm encouraged by the work that we do. Um, just last year, we actually started handing out scholarships to some of our matriculating LGBTQ youth. So we handed out two five hundred wow. scholarships to youth who are actually going to college. So we're real proud to do that. Any donations we get right now will actually go towards our scholarship fund. And again, next year, 2021, is when we look to actually launch our first ever mentoring program. We're going to be pairing LGBTQ youth with adults. And they'll actually have different activities they'll be doing over a 10-week period. So again, encouraged about the work. If you want to find out more about Safe Space Nova, you can just literally Google us, Safe Space Nova. You should pull up, pull up our webpage and find out how you can actually donate and about more about our program. Thank you so much. I mean, 
all of you who are doing this, like on the side, such important work. I mean, your passion is really shining through, I have to say. And I, I really appreciate all of your hard work. Because I mean, full time job, families, you know, and then you're doing these foundation. I mean, it's just amazing. Um, and then lastly, Equality Loudon, Melissa, would you want to, or um, Jerome or Christopher, would uh, Teresa, anybody on that side would like to share some final comments? So I have I, one thing I'll say for Equality Loud, and then if anyone else wants to jump in. So I just want to, we, we only got to touch on it a little bit, but we've had a lot of really great gains in Virginia and in the country and in our county uh, for LGBTQ rights. But I think what our community did, what our community in the past has kind of gotten one thing and we kind of like let our guard down a little bit with marriage equality specifically. And so we found that we lost a lot of those gains. So. Equality Loudon is just getting started. So we may have protections in Virginia now. We may have a pretty positive board of supervisors in Loudon County. And the school board may have gone our way for some of the things we want. But there's a lot more we need to do. And we need to make sure we hold our leadership in our county and our state accountable for all of these beautiful promises we're getting and to make sure that they're positively impacting LGBTQ people in our community. And so we're just getting started. So that's, that's all I wanted to say for that's awesome. Teresa, Chris, has anything else to add for quality Well, I wanted to add on to what Jordan said. Uh, PFLAG is an invaluable resource. And for those who don't know, there is one in Loudon. It's not just for the youth and parents. It's also for LGBTQ individuals and their family. My wife and I have been going to it. I'm going to drag my mother-in-law with me one day. Uh, just it's a wonderful chance. Allies are welcome. It's a place to, to uh, really be inclusive and, and get to learn and hear about people's stories. and in a safe space. But I, I echo what Melissa said. Uh, it, it wasn't 24 hours after the Supreme Court uh, um, results came out about the discrimination um, and people were already talking about how do we carve out religious exemptions? How do we carve out? Uh, don't ever take this for granted. Virginia is a much safer state than a lot and we are so much better off. I think nearly a dozen LGBTQ positive bills came through and were passed ends to um, conversion therapy that was hotly contested. Um, and just so many that are wonderful and, 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 and too many to mention and the wonderful impacts, but the fight's never over because you have to get out and vote. This can be undone with a, a, a swing of yeah. the Congress, of the state house, uh, of the legislature, of the governor's mansion. Mm -hmm. if, if, if things don't go the way and people don't show up, we still have a lot to, of work to do. Uh, and it's it's not gonna stop for a long time. So we really need allies to show up and to help. Thank you. Teresa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, absolutely. And my, um, just to echo what Chris said as well, um, some he, he's right, we got a lot of bills passed, but one of the ones that failed to pass in the house was the prohibit, prohibition of demonstration, demonstration uh, discrimination, public accommodations, employment, credit, um, causing action to sexual orientation and gender um, identity, House Bill 1663. So while there was a lot passed, there were things that weren't passed. So don't, like Melissa said, we can't just get, you know, complacent. You're right, when, when marriage equality, everyone's like, oh, gay people are happy now, right? And we can't get complacent. I mean, you know, we can't get complacent. We have to still find out, go to your local um, um, organizations, PFLAG, Equality Loud, and um, even Prince William, um, Alexander, wherever you are or wherever you know people, go there and ask, how can I help? And I'm pretty sure everyone's going to be like, oh, great, here's a list, right? I know we at Quality Loudon has a list, so if you if you want to get in contact with us, um, please go to our website, qualityloudon.org, and um, just send us a message on Facebook, and believe me, we've got things that you could be working on. Like I mentioned, we really are trying to focus on um, doing educational programming in the community, so um, yeah, that's all I had to say. Thank you, Julie, for this. Oh, no problem. Jerome, did you, are you still on Jerome? Did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I'm still here. I, I'm pretty much everyone said everything. Oh, wait, I think I already, oh, I'm sorry. okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, we already did you, sorry. I thought we passed it over. <laughs> so thank you so much, everybody. I do want to, um, to tell you that if you have anything you want my office to know about, please let me know. Um, especially as we're working in, you know, Teresa, you mentioned a bill that didn't pass that that might have passed. If there's anything like moving into the uh, general assembly sessions, um, our board can support or not support certain bills as they're moving through the general assembly. 
So if you have, for example, if you have a bill that you want the board to be supporting, feel free to um, feel free to, you know, let my office know, uh, you know, we are do a pretty good job of following what's going on in the General Assembly, but I'm also very happy to bring something up and stick my neck out for something that, you know, we all feel is important, even though for some reason staff didn't put it on our, you know, legislative agenda. Right, right. <laughs> And um, if you have anything that you want me to put in my newsletter that goes out monthly, um, if there's any, you know, events or something that you, you want the community to know about, we can share. And then lastly, I wanted to thank you for, um, uh, for coming, but also, you know, the Virginia Values Act, it, you, you guys kind of reminded me, it goes in effect July 1, but I don't know what the county is necessarily doing yet about it. And I did a whole board member initiative on the gun legislation that passed and three of the laws that pertain to the new gun legislation do affect the county locally. So I think that what I'm going to ask my office to do is look into doing another BMI to have staff study. Well, now that this has passed, the Virginia Values Act has passed. What do we have to do as a county to come into compliance for that? And I really, I'm so glad we had this conversation because I hadn't been thinking about that. I did it for the gun legislation, but I think it really needs to be done for the, for the Virginia values act to make sure that the county comes into compliance and, you know, we don't have, we don't miss anything and nothing falls through the, through the cracks. If that makes sense. So Julie, can I take a quick moment just to thank you and your staff for putting this on, uh, yeah. especially y'all have been just wonderful thank you so much together. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Well, everybody, we are right at 501. How about that? Good job. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Happy Pride Month. Woo. Appreciate your time. Yes. And it's so nice to meet everybody. And I, it's so good to know that I have people I can reach out to um, if I have questions or, you know, need help with certain resources and stuff like that. And feel, please feel like the, the communication is two way. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody, Thank you. Sunday. Bye. Bye. <laughs>